Hi, A-Team. Welcome to Assembly TV. I'm Jennifer Pierce, multimedia editor with Assembly Magazine and the host of our podcast called Assembly Audible. On a recent podcast, I spoke with Dr. Robert Smith, provost of Valley Forge Military College and author of Manufacturing Independence, Industrial Innovation in the American Revolution. As soon as I came on board with Assembly, I heard many people talking about Industry 4.0. So during my conversation with Dr. Smith, I started wondering, what industry is this? So I asked Dr. Smith, is this what one might refer to in the industry as industry 1.0? Is that random? Um, <laughs> I, wow. Um, I'd say like... I Googled. And here's what he said. <laughs> 0.5. Um, what? 0.5. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're, we're talking... We're talking pre-industrial. Um, okay. That the the 1.0 hasn't reached the United States or what becomes the United States yet. That's part okay. of that's part of what I talk about in the book. Is that these things? They I shouldn't say I shouldn't say they haven't reached. They've reached, um, but they haven't taken hold. And the reason for that is we don't have the market for it. Okay. There just aren't enough people buying these things. Um, be that be that glassware, stoves, guns, um, teapots. I found this very fascinating. We're talking about the transition from industry 0 0.5 to industry 1.0, right? So I started wondering, what are the steps involved in the evolution from 0 0.5 to 1.0? And what can we learn from it? Check out the entire conversation on our podcast, Assembly Audible, and let me know your thoughts on this video by commenting or contacting me on LinkedIn. Okay, so what happened? How did the Continental Congress begin addressing the problem? Um, we didn't have the capacity to manufacture weapons for ourselves. Um, across the whole um, length of the 13 colonies, it, historians have estimated that there were only about 350 gunsmiths. And how do you mobilize those people? And, and they're all over the place. Um, they're not centralized in any one place. A lot of them were along the frontier and they're gunsmiths, but they make rifles, which is more of an art form than um, the manufacture of, of a practical item. Um, and all of these people, they made their weapons um, and made their items, as I said, as a piece of art. And so this was a really tedious process. And in the, the um, as you're doing this, you're training up apprentices. I mean, that's part of that's part of what you do. And so it was difficult to make these things, um, and it was difficult to make them in bulk. So basically, we're talking the weapons or the guns were one of a kind objects. Mm -hmm and there was lack of assembly line essentially yes yeah everything everything in the colonies was custom made um even even in the large industrial projects like a, a, an iron furnace the, the 1.0 hasn't reached the united states or what becomes the united states yet that's part okay. of that's part of what i talk about in the book is that these things they i shouldn't say i shouldn't say they haven't reached they've reached um, but they haven't taken hold. And the reason for that is we don't have the market for it. They recognize the problem first. I mean, that's, they actually have to learn the lesson. So Congress goes through this painful learning process. The Continental Congress goes through this painful learning process. It, it, can't, it can't ignore the problem. It can't try to buy its way out of the problem. Um, it can't hope that the problem is just going to go away. It's got to actually address this. And they need, need to centralize production. They create a commissary of military stores. So they set up these manufacturing centers. So the first thing is setting up this bureaucracy. They need to actually make the decision to do it. So they build three arsenals over time. The benefit of these things is that they can bring uh, workers together and organize them. You can actually bring differently skilled people into the process if you organize them. So you don't need a gunsmith to make a gun stock. You can get a carpenter to do that. You don't need a gunsmith to make a barrel. You can get a blacksmith to do that. Um, what you do need the gunsmith to do is put it all together. They're the ones that are skilled in that process. And so what they do with these arsenals is 
they use them as centralized places where they can organize the work of these different skilled people. Through 1777, 1778 is the process of building these sites and getting them to work. And they, they, they do. So um, then they put into operation some of these, these different um, production techniques. Okay. So obviously the colonies didn't have robots or machine tools. How did they become more efficient at making arms and ammunition? So yeah, at the, at the arsenals, what they do is they institute what they know about what's going on in Europe mm -hmm. and what's happening in Europe. I mentioned the French, I mentioned the British, they are um, instituting that, that manufacturing 1.0. And what that looks like is um, a division of labor. It's a parallel step to uh, industrialization. So industrialization within my meaning and uh, historians of technology is that um, you're using machines to do the work. So you replace workers with um, lathes, you replace workers with um, water power, steam power, um, you know, we get the, this is the time where we're seeing the, the spinning Jenny and the flying shuttle and all these, these really early manufacturing uh, ideas, but there's another way to do this. Um, and that is to organize the workers, to, to divide up how they do their jobs, divide up the tasks. And we're not talking about an assembly line and a, um, um, interchangeable parts. So you have to have the gunsmith finish all this stuff up. He has to make it all fit, um, make sure it works, um, put it all together, and then they can ship it out. The other thing they do is start organizing things as factories. And so again, we have to realize that even as late as 1776, factories are, are unique. At this point, like we're, we're at this, this turning point in the history of manufacturing, at the end of the, the 18th century where we don't necessarily have to use machines. Uh, are machines better or as good as workers in, in terms of their productivity? Like we're still debating that. We haven't gotten to this place where we're saying, no, we need to have machines. We get immensely better. We are repairing and we're making our own weapons. And, and to give you that, that example you asked for, in 1780, there are 20 gunsmiths working um, in the armory at Philadelphia. If you use what I told you, um, you know, the three muskets a week as the max, they would make a little over 3,000 muskets a year if they were just doing craft production on their own. But during that period and the following year, they make over 35,000 muskets. So that's a hundred, that's a thousand percent increase in their productivity because of how they're organized, because they divide their labor. Um, and at the same time, they're able to repair an additional 35,000 weapons. The other thing to note, um, so we organize these factories where um, you have one set of workers bring in the materials, you have another set of workers make musket cartridges, and then you have another set of workers that ship them out. Um, this organization creates uh, over 11 million musket cartridges. We constantly keep our soldiers supplied with their ammunition. And the benefit of that is that it gives the Americans time to train. It gives them the time to focus on their mission, which is the battlefield. But then we also, we make over, um, 200, well, this department and then the, the quartermaster department as well makes hundreds of wagons. We make the, um, the gun cartridge or gun carriages for all of the artillery. Almost all the artillery we get from the, the French and the ones we produce ourselves are all produced domestically. Um, so none of this is possible without um, this type of organization.